Bismillah, somebody's been asking about uh, the relationship of Islam to Ukraine and those amazing Eastern European uh, peoples. I had the uh, privilege of going there, visiting some of the old madrasas and mosques uh, with my family about maybe eight or so years ago now. And it's obviously for those of us who are European Muslims, uh, which is basically by definition all Muslims who are domiciled in Western Europe and who are fascinated by the incredible story really one of the great heroic stories of the Ummah of uh, Islam in Europe. The heroism of Islam in Spain, of the Inquisition, the heroism of the Muslim countries of Sicily, of Islamic Malta, the great story of Islam in the Balkans, most recently in the Bosnian conflict. Uh, but further east, of course, um, uh, we think about the Circassian genocide, the biggest genocide in Europe in the, the, the 19th century, when about 80% of the Muslims in Circassia were were killed. And then we think about Ukraine, Crimea. So, you know, as, as a European community, we are absolutely focused on what's happening in terms of the you know, Islam as the third Abrahamic dispensation, the one that comes to solve the problems and that historically has functioned as such a healing principle in those places. So uh, we think about Islam in southeastern Europe and the Ukrainian basin up as far as the Don River and beyond. <laughs> and although there are signs of early Muslim uh, uh, presence there from the uh, kind of early Abbasid period, uh, traders in particular, on the Sea of Azov in Kaffa, in Kherson, some of those uh, ancient trading communities, really uh, Islam as a substantive and even majority presence in South Ukraine uh, goes back to uh, the successors of Genghis Khan, the first Mongols. 1227, Genghis Khan dies and has conquered that entire region, all of what is now Ukraine, 90% of what's now Russia. He goes as far as Hungary, uh, but is ruling still from uh, from Karakorum in uh, Mongolia, one of history's monumental episodes of imperial conquest. So he dies in 2027, uh, and the Mongols who are in those regions, many of them settle down. He divides his empire into four amongst his four sons, and the westernmost part, which includes uh, all of what's now Ukraine, goes to his son, whose grandson is Berke Khan. Berke Khan, one of the most significant figures really in northern European Islamic history, because Berke Khan in 1258 is the first to convert to Islam. And he becomes really a very significant Muslim and facilitates the conversion pro progress right across southern Ukraine, uh, even to the north of Kiev. There's very substantial Islamization going on, largely through uh, Naqshbandi and Kubrawi and other Qadiri. Um, tariqas who are establishing tekes and you can see ruins of those buildings even to this day and it becomes really an important part of the, part of the ummah. Uh, people ask well why is it if Russia and Ukraine were so solidly Islamized and became really integrated into the rest of the ummah under this great empire that the Russians call the Golden Horde that they themselves just called Ulus, Ulu, the, the, great, the great nation one of the great episodes of Islamic history, really, in that region. And of course, uh, Ibn Fadlan goes up there, and some of you will have seen Antonio Banderas and Omar Sharif in the famous movie, The Thirteenth Warrior, which is wonderful if you want to see Vikings and Muslims and Ukrainians and monsters all in one movie. Uh, it didn't do very well in America because, uh, well, it has a Muslim hero, so... <laughs> Uh, it didn't play well in the multiplexes, but it's an interesting kind of window into that world. Uh, so Berke Khan has converted to Islam, and it seems he's very devout. And from that time onwards, the interest of the Ulus is no longer at what is going on to the north. At that time, Russia is not united. There are different barons and boyars uh, competing with each other, but to the south. Uh, and hence the, the Muslim Ukraine starts to look to the south rather than to the north. Why is this? Because uh, Berke Khan has good relations with the last Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, Berke Khan, and not Berke Khan. He has good relations with the last Caliph in Baghdad, Al-Mu'tasim, Al-Musta'sim. And then, of course, Hulagu, who is still a Buddhist 
uh, shamanist uh, Mongol treacherously attacks the, the remains of the Abbasid Caliph and kills the last Khalifa and is pressing west. So Berke Khan stops looking to the north and starts looking to the south and he forges an alliance with the Mamluks in Egypt and it's because of their military support with these, these very significant Ukrainian Muslim armies that the Mongols are finally stopped at Ain Jalut and elsewhere. So it's believed to be the case that it was Berke Khan uh, who protected Jerusalem and Mecca and Medina from being completely destroyed by the Mongols. That's one of the contributions of Ukrainian Islam to really the central history of the Ummah. These aren't marginal people any longer. Another interesting thing that happens at this time is following Berke Khan's uh, demise, uh, you have uh, other uh, emirs in that region. Uh, one of them is Mamai, the great uh, emir uh, whose formal name was Kuchuk Muhammad, uh, who again was a great warrior against the sort of barbarian peoples to the north and to the east, one of the people who is expanding the madrasas and the mosques into western Siberia across the Urals. And there are still Muslim communities um, in the Urals to this day from that time. Uh, and uh, one of the stories that the Russian Muslims will tell you is that Mamai, uh, of course, said to have been buried in the great Muslim cemetery, the Mamai of Korgan. It's named after him in uh, the city of, uh, well, Volgograd, now uh, then called Stalingrad. According to the Russian Muslims, at any rate, it was the prayers of the Aulia and the Ahl al-Bayt buried in the Mamai of Korgan that turned the tide at Stalingrad because that was the essence of the, the battle between East and West. And that's where the biggest Soviet war memorial is located, right in the middle of that uh, Tatar Muslim burial ground. There's an eternal flame and so forth. That's the story Russian Muslims will tell you, is that our dead Aulia actually were the ones who defeated Hitler. Anyway. <laughs> um, and then we find through the uh, period of decline following uh, the Battle of Kulikovo Field, which was 1380, which is when Russia starts to become united, and it becomes more or less clear that even though Ukraine, as it now is, is still under Muslim uh, rule, and Islam is really thriving there, but also very big Jewish communities, Karaite Jews and others, Greek communities, it's a typical cosmopolitan Muslim place. To the north of that is going to be Muscovy, leading on to the 16th century and Ivan the Terrible's destruction of Muslims on the River Volga and the Russian push to the east. Um, so uh, southern Ukraine, uh, obviously the Crimea is a Muslim country uh, until the end of the 18th century when Catherine the Great captures it. Uh, the Treaty of Yassi, which is uh, you know, one of the great defeats really for the uh, Ottoman Empire when uh, the Black Sea is no longer just a Muslim lake. Um, and the city of Hajibay, which was the capital of the Uzi province of the Ottoman Empire, was captured and Christianized by Catherine the Great. And 50, 20 years later, Hajibay becomes the city of Edessa. To this day, Hajibay has the official name of Edessa, but it was originally an Ottoman city and, and settlement. And uh, still a very uh, kind of interesting place um, after 1792 in the Treaty of Yassi, Russianized. Uh, but there's, yeah, there is a mosque there um, and uh, some very heroic stories from uh, Muslims who were executed by the communists. Um, Sabarjan Safarov was the great alim of Odessa, uh, who after the Russian Revolution was, was shot by the communists. Also in that era, you find the uh, Jewish communities, uh, which have always been big in the Muslim world, they start to flee from the old Ottoman territories back into the Ottoman Empire because of the pogroms, particularly the 1882 big pogrom of the Jews in, in Ukraine and in Russia. Very many of them flee to the Ottoman Empire. And I've even met American Jews, converts to Islam, who remember how their grandparents in Odessa would always make sure they had an Ottoman passport just in case things got difficult, the church started to ferment a pogrom again, they could move over the border into the Ottoman Empire where they were, where they were safe. So under the communists, things become really difficult. The Muslims by this time in Ukraine are actually a minority. 
And you have various heroic stories uh, in Crimea in particular, where the, you know, Catherine the Great demolished the mosques in, in Crimea and brought in Russian settlers, and it's been a very difficult experience. In 1944, Stalin deported all the Muslims of Crimea, and more than half of them, um, maybe 150,000, died just during the deportations. It was a great uh, catastrophe for them. And they're still trying to come back. Mustafa Jamilev, of course, who's the chair of the Crimean Tatar Medjlis, uh, is said to have carried out the longest ever protest hunger strike recorded anywhere when he was arrested by the Soviets um, because of his campaigning for Muslim rights in uh, Crimea. He's uh, been the uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize, has a medal from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and so forth. Uh, uh, various assassination attempts on him, but he was a kind of hero, really, for the Muslims of the area. So today's situation is that there is a mufti in Kiev, uh, uh, at the, the main mosque in Kiev. Uh, they have about 400, 500 Muslim congregations around Ukraine with about 200 mosques which are formally designated as mosques and about 100 more under construction. A great Islamic revival going on there. Uh, the policy of the Muftis is to send the Imams to study in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, there used to be a Ukraine Islamic University at the Ahad Jami Mosque which is in Donetsk. Uh, that's in one of the breakaway Russian separatist republics in the east. Part of the problem today or in, you know, in post-independence Ukraine has been that the big concentrations of indigenous Ukrainian Muslims have been in the areas that have been uh, annexed by the Russian Federation. Crimea, where Muslims were about 15% of the population, of course once it was 90%, 15%, uh, and uh, also in Donetsk and where the university is, and also in Luhansk, uh, where there is a big Tatar Muslim community. Tatars have a lot of Greek blood, a lot of German blood, a lot of Slavic blood. They're a very kind of ethnically interesting community. Uh, they don't look like Mongols any longer for the most part, but there's a big cathedral mosque in Luhansk. Uh, and there's also a famous mosque in Kharkiv, one of the biggest and most uh, popular in, in Ukraine, which has been, according to reports, slightly damaged in the recent bombardments. It was demolished by the communists in the 1930s uh, because they said it was getting in the way of the river in Kharkiv, which was a complete absurdity. But it was rebuilt by the Muslim community there in the 1990s. Um, in Kiev, you have the main mosque, which is where the Mufti resides. You have the Rahma Mosque and, and a number of other purpose-built mosques, which are quite, uh, quite beautiful, some of them. And in Mariupol, which is now under siege, of course, you have famous Imam Ismail, who is there right now, Ismail Haji Oglu, at the Suleymaniyah Mosque. Mariupol, anciently uh, in a Muslim area, but this is a relatively new mosque constructed with uh, money from a Turkish businessman who works in Ukraine a lot. Uh, there was a report just uh, four days ago that the mosque had been shelled and damaged, but the Imam has got a message out saying that it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and it's interesting, and uh, Muslims there will tell you, that, uh, of course, it's called the Soleimania Mosque because Sultan Soleiman, the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire, who ruled southern Ukraine, uh, was married to his favourite wife, Khasiki Khorem Sultan, who's buried next to him if you go to the Soleimania Mosque in Istanbul. And she was actually a Ukrainian, famously beautiful and really influential, built a number of famous mosques in Istanbul. So that's another connection. So. Where this will end, we don't know. But the Muslim community there has been uh, very active in the current uh, disputes, even though always it's caught between two fires, just as during the Second World War, caught between the Nazi nightmare and the communist nightmare, just like Jewish communities in many ways, uh, but without you know, any kind of real external support or interest. And we just have to hope and pray uh, for a just resolution, really for all ethnicities in this conflict, um, and that uh, everybody receives assurances of security, of stability, that the mosques can be rebuilt, that the uh, community can continue to go on making a, a, a major contribution as it has done in the past. Muslims no longer are Ukraine the way they used to be, even though they always tolerated churches and ancient monasteries there. Uh, but it's still a significant uh, population with very deep local roots. 
And for those who are interested in the uh, amazing history of Islam in Europe, yeah, one of the great hero stories, I would say, uh, unlike Spain, where everything was wiped out um, in the Ukraine, Muslim communities continue to exist under very difficult circumstances um, to the present day. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease the sufferings of the people of Ukraine and of the people of the wider region and inshallah to bring about justice and freedom and equality and inshallah good outcome for everybody in the, the region inshallah.